So going into a little bit more detail now about alcohol. So the way alcohol works is it actually activates GABA and serotonin receptors in the central nervous system, and it inhibits glutamate receptors. So this is a problem because GABA receptors are inhibitory, and therefore alcohol can have a very sedating effect on individuals, making it dangerous. The way alcohol is metabolized is through the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase, which converts alcohol to acetylaldehyde. And then that is further broken down by aldehyde dehydrogenase into acetate or acetic acid. Very important to note, people of Asian descent actually have less aldehyde dehydrogenase, and therefore they can tend to become intoxicated very quickly because they're not able to properly metabolize alcohol. So they can result in having very serious side effects from alcohol, including facial flushing and becoming extremely nauseous after even a small amount of use. When you're screening a patient for an alcohol use disorder, there are several different screening tools you can use. A few to be familiar with include the MAST or the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test, the ADI Screening Inventory, the Audit Test, and also the CAGE Questionnaire. The CAGE is a very easy screening test to administer, so let's go through it in more detail. When you're administering the cage, you're going to start by asking that individual, have they ever felt a need to cut down on their alcohol use? Have they ever been angry or annoyed when people are critical of their drinking? Ask the individual, have you ever felt guilty about your drinking? And finally, inquire as to whether or not they've ever needed an eye-opener, which is a drink first thing in the morning. This can be a telltale sign that there's an alcohol problem. What factors do the absorption and elimination rates of alcohol depend on? Well, age for one, sex or gender, weight, and also speed of consumption. All of these things are going to influence how quickly an individual can metabolize and process the alcohol consumed. Other things include presence of food in the stomach, state of their nutrition, chronic alcoholism, and also whether or not there's any cirrhosis of the liver. So if somebody is drinking on an empty stomach, they already have a poor nutritional status, they tend to drink every day, and it's gotten to the point where their liver is negatively impacted, they're not actually going to be able to metabolize alcohol very quickly, and they're going to therefore uh, have trouble with the elimination of it from their system. When we think of blood levels of alcohol, this can really impact our physiological states. So when someone's had a little bit to drink and they have maybe a 0.05% of alcohol in their system, they're going to have a little bit of thought and judgment impairment. But when somebody's increasing their use, they're going to start becoming clumsy and start reaching the legal limit of intoxication. When they go beyond that and have a level of 0.2%, they can get depression of motor function, meaning that their gait's going to be wobbly, they're not going to be able to walk in a straight line, they're not going to be able to kind of handle things uh, with fine motor and so forth as they normally would. And then as things increase, they're going to become confused and stuporous, and eventually very high amounts of alcohol in the system can lead to coma and even death. This is very important. In the United States, the legal limit for intoxication is 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. And the differential diagnosis when you're encountering someone who may seem intoxicated is think about whether or not they're potentially hypoglycemic, whether they might be hypoxic, if they have a mixed alcohol or drug overdose situation going on, whether they've been poisoned. You're going to wonder about hepatic encephalopathy and also whether or not they might have psychosis. And finally, any psychomotor seizures. These are all things that are going to be in your differential that you want to rule out when encountering the patient who seemingly is intoxicated. 
And when you go to evaluate this individual, you're going to check a blood alcohol level, and also you're probably going to do a CT scan of their head. As we mentioned before, when people become intoxicated, they can become stuporous, clumsy, and so forth. And so these individuals are at a very high risk for falling and actually incurring a head injury that can lead to something serious like a subdural hematoma. And so you want to make sure to rule that out when you're evaluating an individual. So how would you treat acute intoxication? Well, when you're meeting this individual, probably in the emergency room, you want to ensure the ABCs, their airway, breathing, and circulation, and make sure that all of that is secure. You'll check their vital signs and also their blood glucose, and you're going to very quickly administer thiamine and also naloxone, which the latter, naloxone, is help to protect this patient in case they have a mixed drug alcohol overdose. The naloxone will help protect in case there's been any ingestion of opiates. Alcohol dependency, you're going to treat that by referring the patient to something supportive like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or Smart Recovery, which is similar to AA, but a newer version of group therapy that helps people follow a sobriety program through the support of peers. You might also think about doing aversion therapy by giving them disulfiram or antabuse. And this, again, is a medication that actually will uh, be taken on a day-to-day -day basis. And if a patient consumes alcohol while taking disulfiram, they have a terrible reaction. They get that facial flushing and nausea, and it's meant to prevent them from ingesting any alcohol. You can also offer them a medication called naltrexone, and this is a medication that works to reduce the pleasure level of drinking. So what, how it works is it is an opioid antagonist, and it's believed that when people drink while taking naltrexone, they don't enjoy it. They don't have the pleasurable response that's normally associated with drinking, and therefore it makes drinking less desirable. Psychotherapy is another effective option, whether it's one-to-one -one or in a group setting. AA has the highest likelihood of success. So just to note, for people with a chronic alcohol dependency, you really do want to consider referring them to some stepwise supportive therapy program. A little bit more about disulfiram. It we mentioned how it can cause facial flushing and nausea, and this is because it actually inhibits that enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is so important in the metabolism of alcohol. So this is aversive therapy because it will give people an unpleasant effect if they do drink while taking it. Some potential side effects if they do drink would be facial flushing, headache, tachycardia, and vomiting along with their nausea. And then a little bit more detail about naltrexone. As I mentioned, it blocks opioid receptors, in particular the mu opioid receptors. And this prevents exogenous opioids from binding there and thereby prevents the pleasurable effect of opioid or alcohol consumption. It's available not only as a pill, but it can also be administered in a monthly injection, which is a very nice option for some patients. The side effects include nausea, vomiting, and decreased appetite. For patients who opt for the injectable form of naltrexone, that can sometimes cause a local reaction at the injection site and some pain. When it comes to alcohol withdrawal, CNS excitation following the termination of the depressed effects of long-term alcohol consumption. So this is an important note because what is happening is that in withdrawal, the brain is so used to having those GABA receptors activated from alcohol, and these are inhibitory receptors. And so when you take the alcohol away, all of a sudden the central nervous system is overexcited, and this can lead to major problems during the withdrawal phase. And I want to review that a little bit more. So if somebody's coming in and they're in alcohol withdrawal, you want to be really careful to make sure that you're medically evaluating them for some of the problems that can come along. Check them for irritability, sleep trouble, any kind of infective process. You want to check their sensorium and see if they might be delirious. Check if they're disoriented. You really need to monitor this patient for seizure, which is a really serious and significant uh, side effect of 
alcohol withdrawal and also check them for hallucinations, which can be a key indicator to a very bad withdrawal problem. Delirium tremens is the most serious form of alcohol withdrawal. It can begin within 72 hours of cessation of drinking. So remember, this is a patient who's been drinking heavily, all of a sudden stops, and now their central nervous system is just excited and lit up because they no longer have the inhibitory effects from alcohol. And so within 72 hours, this patient might start to have visual and tactile hallucinations. They may get a very severe tremor. Uh, autonomic instability where their vital signs go haywire, and they can have alternating levels of psychomotor activity. This is very dangerous, and you want to assess this patient by checking their vital signs, ensuring their airway, breathing, and circulation, get a head CT scan, and check them physically for any signs of hepatic failure. You can also monitor them by doing what's called a CIWA scale. The idea of the CIWA is that you're initiating it in hopes to prevent something like DTs or delirium tremens. So this is the Clinical Institute of Withdrawal from Alcohol Assessment. And here you're monitoring patients for subtle signs that could be clues they're leading up towards DT. So you're checking them for vital sign instability, you're checking them for headaches, you're checking them for nausea, vomiting. And if they're scoring high on the CWA, you're going to preemptively treat them with a benzodiazepine to help slow down that excitation excitation in their central nervous system. So the differential diagnosis for someone going through withdrawals are going to be an alcohol-induced hypoglycemia, psychosis, encephalitis, a thyrotoxicosis, anticholinergic poisoning, and also withdrawal from a sedative or hypnotic drug. Because not only can alcohol induce a withdrawal problem, uh, patients who are withdrawing from medications, especially benzodiazepines, can also have a very similar looking withdrawal syndrome. When it comes to treating DTs or delirium tremens, you want to give a tapered dose of a benzodiazepine, and this is going to work by helping to uh, inhibit the central nervous system a little bit so it's not quite so excited. You're going to give them the vitamin thiamine. You're going to also give them some folate, a multivitamin, and magnesium sulfate for any post-withdrawal seizures. Mm -hmm.